schedule. Uh, welcome to uh, Hollywood and the digital consumer. Uh, how technology, content, and services establish the next level of the consumer entertainment experience. You know, when we first started putting this uh, panel together, the, this session together, several years ago, part of the design of it was to actually introduce Digital Hollywood attendees to the idea that there really was a digital consumer uh, who was somehow a different species from any other uh, entertainment consumer. Uh, and it was at a time where, for many of the studios, uh, they you know, were not paying the kind of attention uh, to the digital universe uh, that they do now. Uh, of course, a lot has changed, not only in the history of digital Hollywood as a gathering place, but certainly in the industry. And uh, I think we've all, in our pre-event conversations, have pretty much agreed to uh, drop the, world, the word uh, digital consumer. These are really, you know, this is our audience. These are our customers. And it's a really interesting two-way uh, street. So with us today to uh, share perspectives uh, are uh, John Ruby, who's the CEO of Fathom uh, Events, and uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Perlman, who is uh, the uh, head of digital ventures for ICM Partners. Uh, we have Rona Mercado, uh, who is the VP of Client Services at the Kashmir Agency, and uh, David uh, Viviano, who's the Chief Economist for SAG-AFTRA. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we have a number of questions. We'll have a conversation here, and we'll also uh, leave plenty of room for you to ask questions uh, of the panel. But what I'd like to do so that everybody has a perspective uh, is actually first just get an idea from uh, all of you what general fields you come in. So just by show of hands, uh, how, many, uh, how many content creators uh, do we have? And uh, entrepreneurs? and executives or uh, in positions at, uh, at, at uh, companies, distributors, anything like that. Any other areas that you wanna find out where people are coming from? Humans? <laughs> All right. Fans of great experiences? All right. Distribution? Education. Great. Education, nice. great. So what I'd like to do is uh, give each of our panelists uh, a couple of minutes to just uh, introduce themselves a little more fully and give some background uh, on uh, their individual uh, enterprises and uh, areas of focus right now. So John, you want to kick it off? Good morning. My name's John Ruby. I'm CEO at Fathom Events. We are the largest um, movie theater event company. We are owned by AMC, Cinemark, and Regal Theaters, and we um, distribute, uh, market, and activate uh, events from diverse content like uh, the Metropolitan Opera, Broadway plays, rock concerts like Ed Sheeran and Roger Waters and um, the like, uh, Turner Classic Movies, um, faith-based uh, uh, content, just all kinds of things. Basically, our, our criteria is, is this something that uh, people want to come out and experience together as a group? Because that's really, uh, at the end of the day, what we find uh, the, the cinemas offer to the public today, and that is that they are a digital, sorry for that, uh, performing arts center. Yeah, and what's, what's really cool about that is the fact that the, uh, 
that the cinema auditorium can take on the personality of the audience and the content and create a very special shared experience. So I look forward to uh, uh, continuing that conversation with you this morning. Um, great. I'm uh, Jonathan Perlman, run uh, digital at ICM Partners, a leading talent and literary agency. Um, prior to ICM, I uh, ran the business of BuzzFeed Motion Pictures. Um, prior to that, was at Google. So I've spent my um, almost my entire career in the um, cover your ears in the digital space. Um, but now, really, where digital intersects with uh, traditional, with with the entertainment um, in Hollywood piece, and what 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 I see is, I think, what a lot of us see is that the the um, and what I'm slightly infamous for saying is that content is king, distribution is queen, and she wears the pants. I think ever more, um, today more than ever before, you need to have great content. That is the prerequisite, that's the starting point. You can't pass go without it. But then how do you engage and find the consumers in the audience for it? And now there's lots and lots and lots of different ways um, to do that, and that's uh, where I spend a lot of my time. That's great, thank you. Hi, Rona Mercado with the Cashmere Agency. I'm the VP of Client Services. I oversee strategy and oversee all the accounts for the clients that we work with. Uh, we focus on targeting multicultural millennials, so experts in the space of targeting the media savvy, uh, socially empowered um, super consumers. And in, in order to do that, we work you know, very much aligned with what Mr. Perlman here said about content being king, and so how do you really take that content and have native content across these social platforms where people are consuming things? Good morning. I'm Dave Viviano. I'm the chief economist of SAG-AFTRA, um, and I head up our Office of Media and Labor Economics. Um, we are uh, an organization within SAG-AFTRA that looks at the entire media ecosystem and studies the economics of it, uh, as well as the impact on uh, talent in the industry. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with SAG-AFTRA, we're, we're a labor union that represents talent all across different media. So we represent actors in feature films, uh, scripted dramatic television, uh, reality TV, um, live broadcast TV, uh, sound recordings, TV commercials, uh, news and sports, uh, and local broadcasting. And as I say, right now, as far as what um, my team is very much focused on is taking a look at the evolution of the advertising business model, the video advertising business model, um, looking at what's going on in digital media, how that's impacting uh, advertising on traditional media, and then also we're trying to get a much better understanding of the potential for SVOD original programming, subscription video on demand uh, programming, um, and what the, the long-term economic implications of that business model are. You know, that actually may be a good place to start with, uh, since you sort of touched on some of the things you're studying. Uh, how's that shaping up? Because certainly in the whole advertising uh, arena, I, it's shifting the traditional sort of 60-second commercial, which, uh, you know, was the mainstay for a lot of your membership for <laughs> many years, yeah. is shifting, but how is it shifting? And what, what are you seeing there? That, that's a really good question. Um, it, 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 there's a profound change that I can tell going on in, in national video advertising. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, data, um, so if you think traditionally, um, it, everything's relied on Nielsen data, and it's been, uh, inventory has been bought and sold on the faith that people who are watching uh, this TV at this time are, you know, they're having a certain level of engagement with these commercials, and that turns out not necessarily to be the case. Um, and so now there are all these other options open for advertisers, uh, a lot of digital platforms, um, different price points for buying advertising on the digital platforms, a lot of different value offerings. It's not necessarily m measured in the same way as traditional television. Um, and what we're finding is that, uh, at, at the same time, audiences just are watching fewer commercials because they can. So all this is happening at the same time, and you have um, a lot of creative agencies, a lot of national advertisers just trying to do whatever they can, throwing everything at the wall, seeing what sticks, 
Some of it's working, some of it's not. Um, but it's really hard to plan for that. Um, it's hard to budget for that in the long term. Um, and there are some tried and true ways to reach uh, a, a majority or a large segment of the population. And if that's what you want to do, that's, that's rarer. And so the price for being able to do that is being bid up. So what we're seeing is that there's still a very high end for a 30 second spot that's going to be aired during a widely viewed live broadcast, you know, Monday Night Football, something like that. Um, and then at the lower end, um, you have all these web platforms um, and a lot of different agent, uh, media agencies and advertisers are just buying, you know, and, and producing what they can. And sometimes it works and sometimes they, it doesn't. And um, they're, they're, a lot of times they're using professional actors to do it. A lot of times they're, you know, spending $1,000 to just, you know, hire somebody to produce a short video and they have different results on, uh, on digital media. So I'd, I'd say it's still largely in flux and it's, I, I don't want to hog up the time here, but then it's having a lot of implications on the traditional broadcast networks who, ha who make their money uh, selling that ad inventory. It makes sense the agency, or the, uh, from a, an advertiser standpoint, they have to be a little, maybe more clever, but also the dividing line between, you know, sort of a traditional commercial and a something that is done or produced by a brand, for instance, actually becomes a piece of entertainment. Are we seeing, seeing that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take it. I, I have a belief that brands will be the next great Hollywood producers, um, or maybe they already are. Um, but it will only continue, and uh, they will look to not make. They, the, I, I agree. I think the thirty-second spot is not going away, and the traditional, you know, internet banner ad is not going away. But there's a big white space, <clears throat> excuse me, in the middle, and uh, I think brands will say, "Well, why don't? Why am I being interruptive or tangential to what the person has actually gone to consume, and why don't I consume it myself?" Or why don't I create it myself, excuse me? Um, why don't we just create the content? And, and by the way, if we do it and we do it well, that money that we spend, we can get back. I mean, the marketing can become a profit center, not a cost center, um, if they create formats for television or web or whatever it might be that they can sell. Um, and uh, I, I see this every day, that more and more brands are coming to get more and more different kinds of talent. It's not just maybe the traditional acting talent for, for a campaign, but actually looking to get you know showrunners or writers, not necessarily the copywriters from the advertising agencies, um, but they want the the showrunners who can actually create a show. And it's not the type of content that they're looking to create is not uh, you know click here buy now, but rather engaging entertainment uh, based around a brand brief around a premise, but that ultimately they realize that um, with the streaming services. Um, it's harder and harder to get their message across. And so we're actually going back to the future in my mind and back to the days of the soap opera where the brand will actually create and own the content and get value, extract value from that. Yeah, and Rona. on the flip side of things, I have something on the other end of the spectrum. When you talk about different brands um, creating their own content, that's something that we do at Cashmere. We produce something along with Adidas and with Snoop called Turfed Up, which was his own sports talk show. Um, we had a bunch of different people on as guests talking. It was just the lead up to Super Bowl. So it was a really interesting content piece. Um, and you can find it on his GGN channel. So someone like Snoop, we consider him a brand. He's an artist. You guys all know him as you know, a rapper, um, an icon. In, in, in some ways, um, but he's also a big television personality now who TV to people like me, I guess, and my age is TVs online, not necessarily like the large TV that you tune into uh, at this certain time on this day. Um, so for someone like Snoop, being able to create branded content with him and brands has been really powerful. He has a footprint of 70 million on social across the board. So brands really see value in um, you know, bringing us on board to be able to create content pieces that are engaging, that are relevant. And you know, for us, when we're putting content pieces together, it's not so much about let's shoot this piece and let's put it out on all these channels. It's you've got Facebook,
Facebook, you've got Snapchat, you've got Instagram, you've got Twitter, and it's not just a matter of shuffling and repurposing content, it's a matter of really taking content and creating native pieces that are gonna do well on each of these platforms. So, you know, you'll see more and more, as you guys have just mentioned, the different brands and advertising, things are beginning to switch and um, the dynamic is changing a bit where the brands are taking control of their own um, content creation and advertising and you know the, you'll see this kind of um, match up between them and influencers and you know what that can do in the social space and how much that can drive engagement with their brand offline too has been pretty amazing I, I would agree with that as well we uh, worked with uh, one of your brands Adidas on Kanye's shoe launch and that went into 75 theaters across the country. Uh, Kanye. I got a ticket for that, by the way. <laughs> I went to that. <laughs> well, and did you have a good experience? I had an awesome experience. I think, you know, you <clears throat> spoke a lot about experience right. in the beginning, and that was an amazing experience for me because I couldn't be in New York. I wanted to be in New York, but I also, you know, love Adidas. Right. And I love Kanye as much as people are probably going to start throwing things at me for saying that. But, you know, I just. Oh, no, really he is a rabid fan. He, yeah. We've done three events with him. And you literally could not buy a ticket in the open market. Yeah, there were no guys? commercials. Yeah. It, he goes out to his own social media, and then the brand social media gets involved. It's not about commercials because the entire program is completely, uh, uh, it's woven. You know, that, that you don't, in essence, you don't interrupt the story. The brand and the artist are the story. Um, and so, yeah, we've done three events with Kanye. The last was uh, the launch of his brand. It was live from Madison Square Garden. And we had 328 theaters that were sold out privately, no public sale. And he sold those tickets for everywhere from $25, which included the new CD, to $500, which included a special merchandise and clothing package. And, and, you know, uh, another one that comes to mind is Sony PlayStation, their E3 experience. Again, you can't buy a ticket to this. The only way you can be part of this is you can watch it at home on your PlayStation. Or you can register with PlayStation and they fill, I think last year we did 75 theaters, including Amsterdam for their developers. And it's so popular that there is a standby line. So it's like the Academy Awards, you know, where you've got a line for seat fillers. So the, every seat is taken, and yet there's a standby line for people hoping that if you have a ticket, you won't show up, and then you can go in. So there's a really interesting intersection between content and the experience. The Correct. Real life. Correct, and, and, and like I say, it's multi-platform, because these are, these are experiences. Yes, you could experience at home, but you're desperate to go see it with everyone else. And share it with everyone else on social. Exactly. <laughs> well, they, you know, everybody talks about millennials and what's going on, but clearly there's a sort of uh, different dynamic going in, in terms of their behavior, their draw, their you know, entertainment choices, their interests, the way they engage with entertainment. What have each of you, you know, kind of discovered in your you know, journeys through, I would say, the current generation and maybe a little look uh, you know, beyond them to the ones just coming up right now. I'll start. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we, we generally don't focus our analysis specifically on individual demographics that much, but obviously um, the millennials is a huge area of focus for uh, you know, all the producers and the distributors that we work with. Um, what I think is, is most surprising and, and of interest to me is um, seeing how their um, beh consumer behavior towards video content is changing as they are getting older and becoming adults. Because the, the traditional narrative is these are people who never have a cable subscription, they never watch anything linearly, they watch everything on YouTube or something comparable to that, and then that's, that's generally evolved over the last few years um, as they're buying houses, as they're having kids and settling down. We're seeing some changes in um, 
kind of a reversion to some of the, the more traditional media consumption patterns. And I don't know if this is a blip or if this is going to keep up, but it's something that I'm very interested in seeing what happens with. I was at a conference recently. Sorry, John. No, go. <clears throat> um, someone declared that uh, millennials are over. It's now Gen Z, right? Isn't Gen Z. Gen Z is the younger one. That millennials don't matter anymore. It's now Gen Z, the generation below millennials. Um, I don't know if that's true, but uh, they made a pretty compelling case for it. Um, what I find, one of the things I find interesting is um, I, I do have an affiliation with the um, Annenberg School at USC and something called the Center for the Digital Future. And in our research, we find that now it's probably nearly 90% of American millennials sleep with their phone, sleep with their phone. It used to be, we, we charted it years ago, it was, and it started to go down. It was like 85% five years ago, and three years ago it was 80%. What we realized were, was that more and more millennials were sleeping with their phone in their bed. So when we ask the question, do you sleep with your phone on your nightstand, the answer is, in fact, no. Um, they sleep with it in their bed with them. And um, so we now ask the question, do you sleep with your phone within arm's reach or whatever it is? And um, it, it's almost 100% of them do. Almost 100% of them will check their phone either before they fall asleep or right when they wake up before they get out of bed. Um, if they wake up in the middle of the night because they were woken up, they have to go to the bathroom, whatever it is, um, almost all of them will check again at that point. Um, um, we even started to ask, I mean, this is a family show, right? And we're being live streamed. But, you know, if you're with a partner in your bedroom and, you know, in an intimate situation and the phone rings, vibrates, lights up, whatever, will you check? And uh, I think an alarming amount of people said yes. Um, so there's clearly, there's clearly, I don't know if anyone has ever gotten a case of FOMO recently, but there clearly is like a real strong case of fear of missing out. And I think considering patterns of consumption with video, they don't want to miss whatever it is. Um, and so there's a, there's a, you cannot fulfill their quest, their thirst for content enough. It's, it's impossible. I would completely agree with FOMO. I hadn't heard that before, but I, I got it now. <laughs> um, our aha uh -huh moment relative to, um, or realization relative to marketing to millennials as opposed to other uh, ages is millennials by and large want it to be their idea. They don't want you telling them what to do or what you think is a good idea. And, and if, you, if you look at it, it's bigger than entertainment, you know, the whole idea behind Kickstarter and crowdfunding and things like that. If you go deeper at them, it's to, in many cases, it's, um, it's a marketing platform for a product that if you feel a sense of ownership, then you're gonna actually buy that, and then you're gonna tell your friends that you have it, and that's gonna sell even more of them. So we've, we have uh, uh, found that in particular with event marketing that is uh, about you know, uh, a, a millennial, millennial core, if you will, to the extent that we are able to put into um, Oh, demand it models and things like that where it becomes well if you can get 25 of your friends then we'll bring this to you uh, millennials in particular feel a sense of ownership and will actually reach out and say you know I think this sounds cool and I want to be part of this so that's that's kind of what uh, uh, one of the uh, pieces we're working off of right now yeah, and, uh, in terms of multicultural marketing you know um, the ethnic groups over index on utilizing social platforms. So it's really interesting to take a look at that and how they're key drivers in pushing engagement and pushing trending topics on Twitter and driving attention to different things um, that matter or maybe not matter to some. But um, I think if you take a look at multicultural millennials and just millennials in terms of viewing streaming things, you know, 65% of millennials actually prioritize viewing content on their mobile device. So knowing that combined with millennials um, consuming uh, content, um, there's 90% of them who view just content via streaming the SOV 
SVOD stuff. So, you know, it's really interesting to look at those numbers and utilize those statistics in putting together, you know, these strategies for our brands or for our clients. And when you take a look at those statistics and those numbers, and you take a look at how um, multicultural millennials or even millennials like to consume media and just messaging, it's pretty fragmented. So, you know, in terms of our approach, I think in anybody's approach, if you want to succeed, you really have to take a look at the cross-platform marketing approach where, you know, as I mentioned earlier, just repurposing content or just shuffling one piece of content to fit in a 15 second clip or fit on for six seconds on Vine, that's not gonna work. You really have to take the holistic approach when you are targeting multicultural millennials or millennials. You know, it seems to me that, you know, hearing all of this, is a, it, it's exciting, you know, from a content creation, you know, creative uh, standpoint. It, the the audience also is. is Jen and I were talking a little earlier. The the audience really demands, you know, they they have the choice now. They're 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 kind of the super programmers in many respects, uh, at many different levels. Yet they still can't create all of the content. So it seems to also put a certain amount of you know, creative pressure uh, on you know, the content companies or you know, creative individuals uh, to actually produce content that satisfies or serves their interest. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? I think it's a, I think it's a challenging time, but it's not me. Yeah, I definitely think it's a challenging time, but it's really interesting because now everything's about data, right? So, you know, Facebook has changed things where there's branded content and you can put ad spend behind it and things like that. But, you know, a lot of brands now and, and agencies are looking at data in terms of putting their programming together. I think l linear data is one thing, but understanding culture, because a lot of people are marketing to multi cultural millennials or millennials, it's really important to understand culture and touch points and passion points and combine that with the linear data that's available. So I think to, you know, there are challenges in terms of programming, but if you combine the two where you take a look at the linear data and you take a look at the cultural data and insights on inherently what's cool and making sure you're having the right people inform you of these things and providing you with the insights, I think combined you can overcome some of those challenges. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think that audiences right now are really savvy and have higher and higher standards. Um, you know, there's one cynical way to look at the, the media ecosystem and to say that there's, you know, more content out there than ever before, more ways to consume it. And a cynic would say, well, yeah, most of it's terrible content. Um, and to the individual, it, it is, but there's, there's someone out there who likes that particular kind of content. And if you're trying to reach a specific individual or a specific demographic, you have to get it right. You have to make high quality content for that demographic. And what high quality means to them is not necessarily what high quality means to someone else. And the challenge is, is you know, segmenting the audiences, finding out who you want to reach, how to reach it without alienating the people that you don't want to reach, and it's a really hard line to walk and a hard balance to achieve, and to be able to monetize that in the, the, the sweet spot where you can attract the right audience who thinks this is great and monetize it in a way um, that pays for itself and can actually make a profit um, is, is really hard to do. Jonathan, did you have that? Yeah, I, I just, you know, there were something like 409 scripted shows on television last year, and this year there'll be, I don't know, maybe 500 or something. Um, you know, there's a lot of content out there, and I think it's kind of a misnomer to think that, <clears throat> you know, millennials only watch Snapchat, right? They're, they're, they're only on Snapchat. They don't consume other things. I mean, you, you know, if you look at the conversations that happen on social around Game of Thrones for example. Clearly they're watching other things. Um, so I, it's still at the end of the day um, a business that's based around creating great content. I think the challenge is how to find that audience for it, especially audience that is not tapped into the traditional methods of, of you know, data collection or, or understanding. And, um, but, but to say that you know, millennials I'm not suggesting you did, but to say that millennials 
are only interested in consuming content on platforms like Snapchat or Instagram where it's, cons where it's created by their friends, um, I think is a misnomer. Jen, your audience really runs the gamut. I mean, you know, we're, you know, right. <laughs> so what, what are you saying? I mean, in, in, are, are there, are there differences? In well, I, I, yeah, in there's, there's differences and there's similarities. I, we probably are, our most effective tool is social media. Um, but you've got to get it right in terms of the messaging and, you know, how, how that's speaking. You, you don't talk to a, a a boomer with the same um, sensibility as uh, millennial. It's whose idea is this, you know? And 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 how do you create a group movement? But by the same token, when we have you in the movie theater and we're running trailers, you know, we have two-minute trailers that run in front of our events, and we can actually tell the story. And regardless of age, people love stories. And you see it up there on the big screen, you know, whether you're seeing sound, the trailer for Sound of Music or you're seeing the trailer for, um, I don't know, Doctor Who or Sherlock, you know, the big BBC uh, uh, events that they literally play on BBC America. But we'll do 100, 200, 300,000 people over one or two days because everybody's got to come see it together. And we've done the Nielsen surveys, and they say, absolutely, saw it on TV, couldn't wait to come see it with everybody else. It's, it's a shared experience. It's something beyond, you know, just that uh, flat screen experience. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about it because I think the more choices, you know, look at network television. You know, ABC, NBC, CBS, they all have their own apps, right? Well, that's because they, they understand that there is an audience that's cut the cord. And if they don't make it easy, because that, that, the audience that cut the cord is very familiar with navigating online. They can find exact, they can get right to it. And, and you got no shot with the boomer generally, you know, on, on that kind of access. So that's where a GUI is effective in essence with one set of consumers but not effective with another. But it seems to me that in the background, they probably don't write about it on, in, in uh, the Wall Street Journal because it's, you know, it, it's, it's not good for um, driving revenue. But, but I, I think that there's some really smart people in, in a lot of areas of our business from technology to content to creative and, and, and advertising and monetizing uh, all of this that, that is uh, offering choices to different consumers um, and the sky is not falling. When it comes to introducing things to, to the audience, who, uh, who, who's driving the marketing? It used to be, you know, you come up with a movie, there's a studio marketing department, you know, there's a network, they're doing their, their, their piece. Is that changing too in terms of, I mean, a lot of is happening on social, but. Well, to us, it's a partnership. You know, it, it's who, who, who's the content owner? Who's the content creator? In the case of, of Kanye and Adidas, they were full partners at the table. You know, sitting there saying, all right, who are we speaking to? And, and when do we need, uh, you know, and some of the artists that aren't as sophisticated, they just turn over their Facebook page and we do promoted posts and things like that, in essence. You get savvy with what are the tools and what are the effective timing, but it has to be a complete partnership um, with an understanding and a sensitivity of who do you want to activate. Jonathan, when you're you know, sitting around your offices, although I somehow get the feeling that sitting around is not uh, something that you spend a lot of time doing. You have a hammock? Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I nap a lot. <laughs> but given, given your background, you know, what, are, what are some of the kinds of you know, conversations that you're trying to introduce to the other partners? Uh, it's interesting because um, when, I, when I started ICM nine months ago or so, I, I went in with a full list of how I was going to have to convince people that, you know, the world is changing and, and um, you know, uh, we needed to get with it. Um, 
couldn't have been further from, from reality. The reality is, is that everyone knows that it's changing. And it was, how do we figure out what's coming next? Because frankly, there is no answer to it. It's not as if, as if there's a crystal ball sitting somewhere and, and you know, the answers are there and you just have to go and find it. You, the, the answers don't exist. I think you have, to, you have to test a lot of assumptions you have against where we are today. And you come up with a couple answers to that and then you gotta keep testing them because that's gonna, the pace of the evolution is so rapid that if you're not constantly testing things, you're never gonna sort it out. So, so when we sit around and kind of say, what is it, what is next, how do we do it? It's, um, it's not trying to convince that we, you know, to see the change, it's that the change is here, how do we take most advantage of it, right? Where do we find the levers that we can pull where, where our clients can find new new business models, right? And that's what, that's where, that's what's exciting, that's what's challenging, that's what, that's what, you know, that's what's, that's the nut that has to be cracked today is if you're a content creator and, um, you know, you're on, you've got a big network deal, that's great, um, and we should do as many of those as possible because the networks are getting smart to, you know, where to create content. If you don't, and you, have something you want to create today there are so many buyers i mean the it, the world is full of buyers some not paying as much money as maybe their agents would like but um you know there are tons of buyers in the digital space how do you how do you assess those platforms against each other how do you understand if one piece of content is good for x as opposed to y even if y is paying less it's a better place because we'll get the eyeballs um th these are all things that are constantly up for discussion and again um, things that don't have an answer I mean there's no clear-cut answer in retrospect you can say that might not have been best but going in the model the network television model or the cable television model um, that doesn't th those models aren't you can't think about the world in that lens that's a very I don't know 20th or 19th century lens to view um, to view the entertainment landscape in today you got to be you, you have to be incredibly, incredibly nimble. We used to, um, businesses I think, it, it, certainly in entertainment, used to look for economies of scale, right? That was where you would get the most amount of value for. Um, I think we now need to reorientate, reorientate around uh, nimbleness, right? How can you quickly turn on a dime, not build something so you can get the most, make it most efficient, but rather how can you make something that can turn as quickly as possible? From a talent standpoint, are, are you seeing more opportunities or actors, talent busier, with more things being, I, it, it seems that with every website, you know, app having, a, you know, even an audio component, uh, if not a video component, even if some of it is just sort of run and gun kind of stuff, there also seems to be a fair amount of a professional quality that's going on out there. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a lot of work for our members. Um, there, there's more TV programs being produced. There's m much more content because of being uh, of uh, online distribution. Um, the, the, the challenge for our members is that um, as the business model is changing for the entire industry, it's also changing for the actor. So. Um, you know, 30 years ago, an actor could uh, get a recurring arc on a TV series and make his living uh, from that work, of doing that for a year. Now, if you're doing a recurring arc on a web series, you're talking about a very different amount of money, um, and that performers don't always necessarily know what kind of work they're going out for when they audition, um, and actors, that their life is auditioning, and so they spend almost you know every day of the week going on auditions sometimes they get work but when the, they do get the work it's not always the traditional kind of employment that they might have had 20 30 years ago um, but you know the, the bright side is yeah there are more work, work opportunities for our members so it's it's volume they make it up in, in volume they have to <laughs> well but also you know we we see uh, passion projects all the time where it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere um, 
but you know, Will Ferrell made a video called Pearl that's now Funny or Die, one of the biggest websites you know in history, and it started, you know, uh, with, with just a passionate uh, instinct, and we we get that with with. Uh, actors that want to play Broadway or this one wants to do this or this one wants to do that and you know we see it that that we serve we serve the creative community that's that, that, that's kind of our role um, but I just if I could go back to what you were saying earlier it's about choices and sometimes you know you, you look at the the topic of this conference it's all about virtual reality and there's no question virtual reality is going to be a big, big deal in uh, not only technology, but, but in the creative side and, and creating a whole new experience. But I will tell you um, that we've looked at it for Fathom, and our point of view right now is that it's probably not something that our audience is looking for. If you're coming into a theater, and you really want to be surrounded by people of like minds, you don't want to put goggles on and in essence sacrifice that experience. And does the couch provide better execution than the theater seat? So it's, you know, really, and all of you have that choice. Every day you're going to hear new ideas and stuff. And, and just because you don't jump on that train doesn't mean that it won't be successful or that you won't be successful. You gotta go with what your gut's telling you is the best use of your time and resources. I'm gonna open it up to questions in just a second, but I'd love to hear from each of you what uh, either your proudest or most uh, uh, biggest accomplishment in the, the last year, uh, you know, uh, a, a production, a project, something that uh, you know really ignited it, the audience uh, across the year, maybe even surprised you. Well, I'll start, I guess. <laughs> um, on April on April first, we were able to pull off this April Fool's prank along with Google, YouTube, and Snoop Dogg, and it was really interesting because. Uh, <clears throat> We were able to just, you know, have Snoop announce that you could watch any video on YouTube 360 style. So that was a really interesting project for us to film 360 videos and also launch that to the world. Although it was a prank, you know, it's something that's not so far off in, in, the, in the near future. Um, so working on a 360 project this year was really interesting and to see that video and messaging go viral and get millions and millions of hits was, was a lot of fun and interesting to see just kind of where interest is and you know uh, what the feedback was and, and what the comments were on that. Um, I, I'd say our, our biggest the recent accomplishment is uh, the negotiation of a commercials contract. Um, this was done about a month ago, and uh, SAG-AFTRA negotiated um, with the ANA, the Association of National Advertisers, and the 4As, which is, uh, represents the ad agencies, um, to, for terms for compensating performers who work in commercials. So this is 30-second spots on TV, Super Bowl spots, uh, digital video ads, radio commercials, so it, we, we cover all of this. And it was a really difficult negotiation because you have uh, the advertisers and the agencies who are going through a period of major transformation and then the actors who are finding a very different way of making a living in this environment and getting everybody to find a solution that works for everybody's needs going forward was actually really hard, but I think we accomplished it. And it's important, you know, we, you know it, it ultimately, you know, people do have to earn a living, you know, and uh, being able to get everybody down to a table and find that common ground, it's, it's a good one. Um, I would say um, in the first five days of January, um, we had uh, Sherlock, the new season for BBC America with Benedict Cumberbatch 
over two nights, did over 200,000 people, uh, $2.5 million, and literally outgrossed Star Wars on the screens that it was on for a television show. And then we went to CinemaCon, which is the film industry's uh, worldwide conference, and CinemaCon presented uh, the BBC with uh, the Excellence in Event Television Award for this year in recognition of all the Doctor Who's and uh, uh, Sherlock's and concerts and Monty Python and all the different types of content that they brought to uh, you know one and two night screenings in uh, movie theaters across the U.S. It's just you know the uh, I think it goes to your point earlier um, um, representing the 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 actors that you never know where these things are going and you have to find a fair way that we can bring the content to the audience where they want it on their terms. Because at the end of the day, we, that's who we serve. We serve the fans. Um, and it's, it's our willingness and ability to find the common ground and find ways that, that in essence we can all prosper together. That's our future. Jonathan, do you have one? I'm just happy every day I wake up. I view that as an accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> Try and survive the day. Um, the, a couple of things that I can't yet talk about, but it's, it's the idea of finding these new models and finding these new, you know, for projects that were dead, but you, you, you found somewhere else to sell it, maybe in a different format or function. Um, and, and, you know, really, you know, every day, you know, amazing talent that has amazing ideas in trying to take that conceptual thing into a tangible output as, as a business. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't, but, uh, but it's that process that, that's very interesting. The, the opportunity to explore it on a daily, daily basis. I'd like to uh, open it up to uh, questions, because uh, we have, sir. I mean, we, we have contracts in place that allow that to happen. Um, there are terms in the contract that are called for where you have to compensate performers, if some, not necessarily along these lines, but if it moves to a different network. Um, and then there, if there are uh, different circumstances, then the union considers them on either a waiver basis or at the bargaining table. So one example is the uh, digital subchannel networks. Um, this is a, a relatively new phenomenon where there are these um, television networks that are just aggregating the secondary digital channels, um, and there's a, a home for library content here, and it didn't exist anywhere else. And uh, under our traditional uh, terms of compensation, you'd have to the the producer would have to pay for broadcast television rights, and so you know we recognize that it's a different economic model here, even though it is broadcast television. Um, and so we came up with a new rate for it. So we're doing our best to, uh, you know, adapt to the needs, uh, changing business models, as well as, you know, figuring out where the audience is and how they're consuming their content. It's evolving. It is a constant discussion and dialogue. Um, in many of the uh, union and guild agreements, there is no real differentiation between event cinema and full theatrical runs. And so the economics are completely different. Um, as well as, you know, uh, um, the fact that, uh, that the marketing benefits 
you know, the, it, with the BBC programming, it's generated the largest, uh, you know, tune-in audiences on the channel at the same time it's in the cinemas, which, if you think about it, makes a lot of sense because, you know, the movie theaters are, well, it happens with pay-per-view boxing. We've got Canelo and Khan, you know, this weekend, and we're, we're in a couple hundred theaters, and they're live on pay-per-view across the United States. Well, we're telling people, watch it on pay-per-view or come see it in the theaters, your choice. So, but I, I think that in particular, the consumer um, moves around pretty quickly, and you know it it uh, it it takes continuing dialogue and better understanding on everyone's part. But I would say that that uh, overall, everyone is interested in trying to grow. Um, the amount of dialogue that leads to more transactions and more benefits to you know the audience and the membership. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there are always trends. I don't know that that cements as what will be happening going forward, right? I think you, there was, and there still is a huge attention on influencers, rightly so. Uh, the question I have is what will happen, how do those influencers age up, right? When you're 16 years old and do, you know, makeup tutorials, when you're 18 or 19, is your audience still with you? Is your audience onto something else? Is, are the 16-year-olds that were your audience now onto another 16-year-old and all of a sudden you can't, you can't bring them with you? Um, there's still a lot of questions in that because we're, it's so nascent, we're not, we're not there. Um, influencers have a very particular role. There's no question of their power and their, uh, quite frankly, their influence. Um, however, I still, I don't know that influencers will replace traditional talent, right? And, and can those two come together? Absolutely. Um, is there, will the models have to change? Undoubtedly. Um, are there trends that we see whereby it, it's, I mean, we, we see from casting perspectives, right? Questions being asked about social followings of names of talent that, you know, people would have heard of. And they say, oh, well, for this particular role, we're looking for an influencer, you know, who will play themselves, not expected to be somebody else, but then also help market. Um, yeah, I think we're seeing all those, but I don't yet see a trend line that will cement itself as, as what it will be going forward. I could give you a real quick spin on that. We had an event with Neil Young where we played uh, Russ Never Sleeps and Human Highway, and it included a live discussion with Neil and Cameron Crowe, and the focus of the evening was Neil Young, the filmmaker. So it was, it was, a, it was a completely different dialogue, and it, ena it enabled the fans to experience Neil's sensibility as a filmmaker beyond what they already know about him as a musician. Sir. Yeah. 
call me Mr. Perlman. I feel like my father is here. <laughs> Dad? I didn't know you were here. Um, I, I think it goes back to what John was saying, is that um, you know, more and more people are looking for an experience, right? And you can't, it's hard to get, it, it's impossible, in fact, in fact, to get a shared experience when you're alone on your, on your mobile device. Um, um, I mean, as far as brick and mortar, I, I don't know if that, if you're referring specifically to going and buying a movie ticket or buying a pair of shoes in a store and not, you know, sort of online. Yeah, I mean, just really br briefly, I think no one has solved the clicks to bricks kind of idea where you re research something, spend time with something online, and then go actually to a physical store to, to purchase it. Um, I do think, though, that, that you know, there's this, there's this balance. There are times when you actually want to go to a physical location and touch and feel and hold you know, for some purchases that you don't necessarily want to do. Um, online, but you then can't obviously get the scale that you necessarily would if you're doing it on digital channels. Yes, sir. I have a sir. question on CPM itself. Um, what do you think the validity of that model is in relation to current uh, content outlets, given that it's based on previous content outlets that in newspapers and other forms which don't bear to today's content? One, and then number two, you mentioned kind of the bricks and mortar Yeah, so in terms of CPM, um, you know, maybe five, three to five years ago, it was so important for all of our clients that we were working with. It was just CPM everything. Um, you know, what's the click through rate? Um, you know, all of these terms that you typically hear, right, in digital and online advertising. But the shift that we're seeing now is what's the engagement like? So it's not necessarily now, for us at least with many of the brands we work with, about the quantity, it's more about the quality and the type of engagement we're getting from these influencer, influencers that are posting or the type of content that we have up. And then in terms of the brick and mortar and social and driving that into answer um, the other music executive over there, uh, you, uh, your question is, um, you know, I spoke a little bit about cross-platform marketing. That doesn't necessarily just mean social and online, but, you know, it's the whole cohesive approach in terms of what's the call to action. So, you know, for a music client, it could be here's this awesome social campaign that we're gonna activate on and here's all of these different social assets that we're gonna release across all these social platforms. But you can still drive to a physical location and that's why you're seeing success with different streetwear lines that are releasing capsule collections or, or you'll see people on Fairfax lined up outside of Supreme because it's only X amount of items that are available at that location. So I think it's a marriage of everything and it's you know, a combination of cross-platform marketing in real life, social, social networks, um, the content that you're creating, and then if you can have a physical piece, because so much now is about, you know, and for Fathom, I think it's so awesome because you're getting an actual experience, you're getting to participate in that, and as much as, you know, we focus on multicultural millennials and the social space, um, we do find a lot of value still in the in real life experience, having something tangible for our group of people to want to hold on to and touch and feel and then share on their social. So it's a combination of everything. The most value you'll find in terms of budgets, of course, for clients is going to be digital because then you can spread that out. But if you can have a combination of all of those things from digital, social, um, your branded and, and sponsored content to a real life event where people are then sharing, that's kind of the, the you know, the perfect storm of all things. 
Uh, one um, soundbite on that is CPM comes from um, the land of what we know. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like audience share and, and things like that. And those you can file under reasons why nobody gets fired, you know, if you make a bold move and for whatever reason, it, I mean, literally we, we had events on the nights when some of the Republican debates were going on and walk-ups we thought were going to be there weren't there, <laughs> you know, so, um, but I, I think that, that in particular, there are CPMs like, uh, movie theater advertising is at an all-time high. You can't change the channel and, you know, um, and you know exactly who you're talking to. So, and, and there, are, there are television shows that deliver that type of, you know, m maybe there's not a Pepsi can in, in, the, in the screen, but the whole brand identity is, is at the heart of what that, uh, of, of the way that show is constructed and written and things like that, and a brand manager says, that's where I want my product. Our customer is part of that. And, and so at the end of the day, I, I think it's, it's those types of decisions and those types of, of, of creative and, and marketing partnerships that, that are at the heart of, of our future. As we wrap things up, I just want to ask each of you if for either your biggest hope or what you see as the biggest challenge uh, in the year ahead. You can start with David. Sure. I, I mean, I'd, I'd say the biggest challenge uh, for me and my organization is, um, you know, if figuring out what the, what the future business models are, not only uh, in a way that we understand them um, and we can agree with them within our own community, but also uh, coming to an understanding with uh, the producers, with the studios, with the networks. Um, that's really hard because they're all competing with one another and they have their own ideas on what the future business models are going to look like. So to the extent that there can be any common consensus understanding, that would be uh, something that would be extremely beneficial and something that we're going to be working very hard to achieve. Um, something I'm hopeful for or excited about really is um, diving into the VR world. So how does that intersect with social even? So, you know, right now you can go to someone's Facebook and look through their timeline and see photos or a video, but what's that experience going to be like with virtual reality? And how do we apply even at Cashmere just, you know, not everything you know, we talk a lot about millennials and how they like to consume things, but even in the millennial space, it's still, there's different segments and segments. There's different nuances from Asian American to African American um, to Hispanic American. So how do we take all of those insights and apply that to you know, wearables and, and the VR world and tie that in with social and how people are interacting on social. So I'm looking forward to working on um, several campaigns uh, that we kind of have some ideas on um, and just seeing those kind of coming to life. Um, I think my biggest hope is that we don't elect Donald Trump president in the next year. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> that's my biggest hope. Um, um, please. Um, uh, but more core uh, to this conversation is, I think my, my hope and my fear are actually the same one. It's just the proliferation of platforms, right? And that's exciting because so many new places, so many new opportunities to get what you have made your content out there to new audiences. Um, it also can be overwhelming because there's just so many and it's impossible, as I said, there's no crystal ball. You can't stay on top of every one all of the time, know exactly what's happening because there's something that's being cooked up in a, in a garage in Playa Vista, if there are any garages still left over there. Um, right now. There's an amazing digital theater over there. there okay. <laughs> the new Something cooked arc. up in the new amazing <laughs> digital theater over there that we can't even think about. Um, and that, that, that is both, you know, I think more cause for celebration, but also cause for uh, maybe some sleepless nights. Okay. Um, I am most excited about um, just the promise of tomorrow, the fact that, you know, we've got about four million people coming to our events this year and 
We're in the middle of a technology upgrade on our network that will enable us to take our 1,200 screens and not only light them all up at one time for the Matt and Kirk Cameron and BBC content and stuff like that, but also uh, split them up into three or four little subnets and you know do NHL hockey and, and boxing and things like that um, and serve different audiences uh, at the same uh, time in different places, so. That's great. That's an optimistic note, and uh, I want to thank everybody for being with us to hear this conversation, and especially our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.